What's up? Mr. Enos. Having a blast, buddy. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just uh, living the dream. Me too. Maybe. Am I sharing the right? I'm not sharing the right screen yet. Boom. Share. Present. Everything's going a little crazy on me today. Don't worry. I got uh, a friend of mine called me. He's uh, uh, he's works for the State Department out of uh, Washington D.C. and they got a whole lot of National Guard in D.C. today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, folks. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to have you on the on the Zoom today. Um, we're going to talk about um, just go over some of the you know as we do all the time. We're going to go over some truck data. I included some more states um, that we're going to be that we're going to be taking a, a gander at probably every week. If you find this beneficial, um, we're going to look at the COVID data. We're going to give you an an update on where we're at in the vaccine, and then we're going to talk to our partners. So once again, thanks everybody for joining us on this uh, fine Friday morning. So let's just take a look at some trucking data. And this is always fun. So if you haven't been on this before, if this is your first time on Zoom, um, here at the Nevada Trucking Association, we have some access to some tremendous research uh, through the American Transportation Research Institute and through our friends at Freight Waves, um, the Sonar program. And this is always kind of interesting to look at. So um, this is some data that we've been looking at. What does trucking look like uh, in the United States of America today? And this is both inbound and outbound freight. And we always see after the holidays, we've got a dip. We see, um, we see freight volumes dip and then come back up. And if you look at where we're at today across the country compared to where we were a year ago, we are, we are higher than we were a year ago. We're higher than we were at the peak of the pandemic. Yeah. So trucking is still moving. We have not seen that decrease that we typically do. Well, we did see a bit of a decrease, but it hasn't do decreased what? to the levels that we typically expect sure. after, the, after the holiday season. Um, where, are we, where are we in the state of Nevada? Hey, Polly, hold on, Polly. Hey, if you, everybody can go on mute, please. Uh, we're hearing a lot of conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I always appreciate having a cop. Uh, <laughs> here's where we're at in the state of Nevada. Once again, you can kind of see this is um, the, the blue line is the inbound freight. The green line is the outbound freight. And, you know, for a state like Nevada where we don't make a lot, don't manufacture a lot, um, you're going to have greater inbound freight than outbound. But you can see, compared to where we were at in January of 2020, we're still far above those levels. So this is kind of fun, and I haven't showed this before, but um, uh, going to just show everybody kind of where we're where we're at, um, where we're at today in terms of just kind of an overall look. And this is a fun graph. Um, Freight Waves looks at 138 different markets across the country, including Reno and Las Vegas. And they've got tremendous data looking at, you know, both your inbound and your outbound freight, looking at what the head haul is, looking at, you know, how much, how much freight is rejected by carriers and where the pricing is. So you can see just a Reno to Las Vegas. And I know there's not a tremendous amount of traffic between those two areas, but I just wanted to kind of show folks uh, where we're at. Um, the pricing power is pretty balanced in both Reno and Las Vegas between the hey, shipper Paul, and, the, getting, and the carrier today. So that's, where the, that's where the power is. If you look at rates, and this is really kind of interesting, looking at where we were a year ago to where we're at today, that rate per mile up 44.4% year over year. So, you know, we do have 
fewer truck drivers. We do have a lot of trucking activity going on. We do have tighter capacity and you can see how this, this impacts rates. So this is always kind of a fun thing to, to take a look at. You know, I could put any market in here in the country that's over 250 miles. Um, I'm gonna take a look at a couple more metrics that we have from, from freight waves. Um, this is violations. And this is a number that I always love to talk about with our friends of the Nevada Highway Patrol and FMCSA. We wanna look at what is that violation to inspection ratio? How many clean violation or how many clean tickets do we have uh, relating to violations? And you can see, you know, some states tremendously higher. They don't have the great partnership that we do here in Nevada where we have law enforcement that is not just going after the bad carriers and punishing them with violations. They're also giving those good carriers clean inspections. And we're gonna talk about a little of that today because I've had some, some questions for some folks. But just so you can see, you know, if you're in uh, the Nutmeg State or the Granite State or the Grand Canyon State up here on the, the top left part of the screen, your chance of getting a violation is tremendously higher than getting a clean inspection. You can see down here in Nevada, we're on the right-hand bottom part. Um, it's almost a one-to-one. -one. So for every, for every violation, you're also getting a clean ticket, which is a great thing. Now, if we just wanna look and see, you know, kind of how Nevada has been, um, you know, over the, over the last few years, you know, taking a look at this data, we saw a huge spike uh, during the pandemic. Why do we see that spike? Because High Patrol and a lot of folks stopped doing level one inspections. They were just looking for those carriers where they saw a problem. So of course, you're gonna have violations go up, not as many clean inspections. Um, I do believe we have somebody on from, we do have Lieutenant Plowman on from the High Patrol today. I've had some questions from carriers saying, hey, we're going through the, we're going through the ports of entry in California. We're not getting clean inspections anymore. Um, I know High Patrol, um, Don can, Don can uh, talk about this in a few minutes. While we have a great relationship with them, they actually have some challenges that we're gonna talk about um, as, as we get to our, to our stakeholder update. But you can see we're back down to a level where it's a one-to-one -one. and I'll tell you what, I'll take a coin flip any day of the week you know, a clean, a clean inspection versus a violation. It does show that we have law enforcement here in the Silver State that is not just punishing the bad guys, but giving the good guys a, uh, a, clean, a clean ticket, a clean bill of health. Um, detention time, something that your drivers deal with. And this is some great data. So I love this. This is updated every night at 1130. So where are we seeing the greatest amount of detention times? It's in the air freight and logistics. That would tend to make sense with a lot of these vaccines uh, coming by air to have you know, a greater wait time there. Um, this is in minutes. So you're looking at about two and a half hours. And this is across the country. Now, the fun part is we can go into, this is just your subsectors. We can also go in to your individual markets and say, okay, what is the detention time look like in the various markets in Reno, in Las Vegas? What does it look like at the ports? What does it look like at the, at the airport? So right now in Nevada, you can see both Reno and Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas average detention time of 138 minutes. Um, in Reno, two hours and eight minutes. McCarran Airport, a little less. Um, looking at the ports where a lot of folks go, uh, Port of Oakland, Port of Long Beach, um, you're looking at Port of, Port of Los Angeles, 116 minutes detention time, 134 in Long Beach, Port of Oakland, 84. So, you know, um, a lot less in Oakland. And then at the, the rail, uh, rail yard in, in Stockton or, or Lathrop, uh, 133 minutes. And you can kind of see how, you know, you're looking at where it's been at over the course of the last year. Um, the only one that's uh, really kind of a, 
above that that's peaking above that is the Port of Oakland, which is um, still less than anywhere else. So this is just some fun data, some great metrics to have. This is data that we used when the pandemic hit to show our politicians, to show our regulators that we had an issue. We needed to have that hours of service, um, hours of service exemption because these numbers did did uh, did get pretty high during that time. Um, so this is our trucking data for the week. Now we're going to take a look at the, the COVID data, where we are with the numbers. And just to let folks know, I'm still um, trying to get used to um, the, new, the new style that they, that they have. Um, you know, it was interesting. I was driving home last night and driving by a, a hospital. It's down here in South Reno. And just seeing the line of cars that was stretching all the way out into the into the roadway for for COVID tests. So, you know, I think there's just this huge demand for uh, for COVID testing right now. Um, this was where we were at last week. Um, we had a positivity rate of 20.6%. Um, here's where we're at today. We have seen that increase 21.6%. Um, you know, we are seeing that positivity rate go up, um, unfortunately, here in Nevada, um, just to see where we are, you know, on a, you know, on a county basis. Um, this is this is where we're at throughout the state. Um, you know, of course, your rural counties tend to be doing uh, a little better um, than our urban counties, although with the exception of Churchill County. So, you know, we are seeing um, Churchill kind of as the, the county that is a little higher than the, than the rest of the state today. And, you know, just kind of a county tracker. This is where we were at last week. Uh, we now have both Story County and White Pine that are out of the black. So, you know, that's good for those places. You know, hopefully we'll see that improve as we move forward. Um, you know, in terms of deaths and, you know, what, what we're seeing in terms of folks that are unfortunately dying from them, 63% are people over the age of 70. And when you take a look at the number of cases, um, oops, did I not put that in? I guess I didn't put that in. We're seeing more cases happen with younger people who are able to survive it. So, you know, that is a good thing. Um, here we are in terms of, of uh, deaths. This is where we were at last week. Um, that 14 day moving average of um, 18 daily deaths. Unfortunately, we have seen that go up to 21. Um, so we're seeing some of these numbers increase. We don't want to see that. We are starting to get some intel from our folks in the legislative session because we're seeing these numbers increase that they're gonna start the legislature closed. Um, we'll kind of see what happens. We know that Governor Sisolak did um, extend the pause uh, this week in a speech he gave talking about the vaccine. Um, so that pause is now extended to Valentine's Day. So, you know, our friends in the restaurant industry, 25% capacity, that is, uh, that is sticking around. Um, Here's where we are in terms of the demographics. So once again, we see the, the lion's share of cases happening in folks that are 40 and under. So the nice thing about that is those people can get over it. Those are the ones that are least susceptible to death. Here's where we were last week, um, you know, comparing ourselves to the rest of the country on the infection rate. So we were the, the fourth lowest in the country um, the number has not changed from week to week, but you can see a lot of states are, are doing better than, than we are. So uh, we've kind of moved up, um, you know, in, in terms of comparing ourselves with the rest of the country. However, that rate, that infection rate has actually, has actually been fairly constant, um, you know, for the last, for the last few weeks. So that's where we're at with the COVID numbers. Now, we've always heard it is going to take, this is a health crisis. It is going to take a health solution 
to be able to solve this problem and be able to address this problem. And the vaccine is seen as the key to being able to get over this. You know, when we have a large majority of the population who has taken the vaccine, we can now achieve herd immunity and hopefully all get on with our lives sans masks, sans restrictions. We changed this uh, this week. This vaccine playbook has been updated. Uh, we did have tiers. Those tiers have now been changed into buckets or lanes. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversations about who gets the vaccine? How is this prioritized? Some of that has changed. So I just want to kind of go through this and go through a process that we are creating here at the Nevada Trucking Association to address some of the issues that our industry has. Um, so let's just kind of walk through uh, walk through the, the vaccine and where we're at. And I just want to let folks know, this can change. The information in terms of when they're going to be ready to go for our folks, that, that's going to be a week to week thing. Um, the state knows how many vaccines they have on a weekly basis. We are communicating with them. We, are, we have talked to them about this process that we're establishing here. So we are keeping in contact with them. I've asked them for as much lead time as we could possibly have uh, to get this going and moving forward. But I just wanna show everybody kind of where we're at right now. So, you know, we are in this phase one tier one phase a that is making sure that the healthcare law enforcement those folks that were initially in tier one um they're getting their vaccines and then what they did instead of you know having a tiered process where i think trucking was in tier two six um they've kind of changed it and we'll kind of go over how this is this is going to work so Here is how they determine who goes in what group. So what is that level to exposure that someone may have for COVID-19? Of course, you know, for folks in healthcare, folks in uh, law enforcement, people that are in long-term care facilities, um, that level of exposure has been high and that length to exposure is a lot longer than somebody who's just, you know, kind of passing by. Um, what is the importance of that job? You know, is it something that is hard to replace? And we know that truckers are definitely in that category. What is the likelihood of spreading about the community? What is the mortality rate? Well, we just saw, looking at that death rate, that folks over 70 were the ones, 63% of the deaths. So, of course, those folks are, are, are the ones that are going to get a priority. And then, you know, how do folks react to the, to the vaccine? So those are some of the things that they are that they are looking at, you know, in terms of trying to develop this tier system. Now, this is going to be different county by county. So a lot of the rural counties that don't have a big population that have those vaccines, we could see that running through this tier process a lot faster than people in urban areas. So talking to some of our members in rural Nevada, the hospital has already reached out to them and said, hey, we're gonna be ready to go. Can we go in and, and vaccinate your folks? So that is kind of what's what's happening right now. Um, we, are, we are gonna see some differences. I know Clark County uh, is a little behind and that makes sense since that's where 70% of our population lives, they're going to have a lot more people in that tier one that they're going to need to get vaccinated, vaccinated while Washoe County has already gone through tier one, starting tier two with the educators. So what is, what is this new process look like? So these are the lanes. Um, and it's two lanes. You've got all the folks that are in the essential workforce, and then we have the general population. So these things are going to be happening simultaneously. So folks that are 70 and older, 
in the general population, they're going to be the ones that are first in line. And, you know, of course, public safety, security, and this is after, once again, this is after tier one, after those folks in healthcare, those folks in long-term care facilities, this is after that. So public safety, uh, community support, frontline supply chain and logistics. So this is where we kind of get into some details and I've had a lot of questions that we'll uh, kind of go into a little bit. What does this mean? This is end to end for the supply chain. So this is, this includes uh, warehouses. Um, this is, you know, processing, packaging, storage, everybody who's involved in, in that process, which includes, you know, our friends at FedEx and UPS, messengers, truck drivers, both local and long haul. This is part of that end to end supply chain where we're in that, we're in that prioritization. And then, you know, all the folks that help selling food. So all the people at the grocery stores and we can see, you know, that includes, you know, from pet food to food that we eat to beverages, to pharmacies, convenience stores, and that includes everybody. So that's your people in IT, um, all the people that support the, the process at a grocery store, the folks that operate warehousing, and they're looking at this holistically. So those are the people who are helping on HVAC. That's the janitorial staff. You know, those are the people that are doing e-commerce. And then we get to manufacturing, same process. So what they're looking at is end to end. I've had people say, well, should I just get my truck drivers done first? What if I have somebody in janitorial? What if I have a dispatcher? What if I have a, a mechanic? It's the whole process. So the, the whole process of running a trucking company, everybody that's involved in that is eligible to get a vaccine when they start offering it to the supply chain, uh, the supply chain trucking logistics section. There's also other transportation. So this is for the people who are maintaining vehicles, repairing vehicles, all of the folks that are critical to building those vehicles, to distributing them, selling them, renting them. So this is everybody. So this is a holistic approach. We're not gonna get into a whole debate or question about well, hey, is this person in my office essential? If they're in your office, they're part of the supply chain, logistics sector. Yes, they're essential. They can go in and they can register for the vaccine. What is that going to look like? So the state of Nevada has created a website where you can go and you can fill in that vaccination interest form to say, hey, you know, I'm either an individual or I'm, I'm an employer um, and I want to get the vaccine. So you go in there, you answer some questions. What are they going to need? And I want to go after the, I want to go through this again. We talked about this last week and, you know, talking about kind of a, a little rub that we've experienced. So proof of identification and they want to have your credentials from your organization. I spent the early part of this week calling 20 different trucking companies asking who has employee credentials. And I mean, these are all sizable companies. You know, these are folks, um, you know, who are employing a hundred or more, a hundred or more people. And out of that group, there were four companies that have employee badges or employee credentials. How do we address that? in working with the folks at the state uh, Bureau of Health, we have set up a process. So our folks are gonna be able to go to the Nevada Trucking Association website and they are going to fill out. And this isn't for you to do as a company. We're gonna, we're gonna send this link to you and then you send it to your employees. If they want to get a vaccine. This is where they're going to fill this out. They're going to fill this information out. And then they're going to get a letter from us 
that says, hey, this individual who works at this company, we're asking for a DOT number just so we can show we're doing our due diligence and trying to ensure that the folks that are part of this industry are the ones that are signing up for this, um, asking for your address, your information that's, gonna, that's going to um, be the same on the ID that you're showing. And it's gonna populate a letter and then you're gonna take that letter in to get the vaccine. That is how you will be able to demonstrate if you don't have that employee badge, if you don't have that credential from your employer, that's how you're gonna demonstrate that you're part of this workforce. So I've had folks ask, hey, can we upload all of this data you know, that we have for our workforce? While that may be ideal, especially for some of the bigger ones, on our end, that would be a tremendously more difficult database for us to be able to create. So I know this isn't ideal, but it's ideal for us. This is not going to be a bunch of data entry for you. You're going to send this link to your employees, and they're going to be ready to fill this out. We will have this ready to rock and roll and ready to go live as soon as we, well, it will be ready before that, but as soon as we hear from the state saying, hey, uh, we're ready for you guys, or you guys are five days away or a week away from getting it, this is going to go live. You're going to get that information. So, and I would just ask, and we got to fix some things on this little form that it's only your eligible employees that are doing this. I don't have the time or bandwidth or wherewithal to go and verify, hey, does this person work here? I'm just asking folks to, you know, be honest about it. You know, we, we, we do represent a lot of honest folks. Um, so, you know, I understand some people are worried, but that's how this is gonna, gonna proceed. So that is the process. If anybody has better ideas for us to do this, please let me know. Um, in talking to a number of folks, this was, I think, the best way for us to be able to move forward, for folks to have that um, credential so they could go and get the vaccine. Um, if your company's big enough where you're doing that, you don't have to go to our website. But the reality is, and we understand, most of our members don't have this. So that's how we're trying to get around this. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts, um, concerns on uh, well, how we're moving forward? Paul, this is Bruce, and I, I really like the idea. I mean, the more I look at that is, you know, uh, other trucking companies using our association uh, to be able to pull this down. <clears throat> and it also keeps our association as the association to keep them aware and keep them apprised of what's going on, especially in their industry. Uh, so I think the growth factor um, is huge by people using us and using the association than just going out and doing it. Because again, it's just an added benefit to them to use us. Uh, and then they can, I mean, come on, they could, they could be on calls. We can have separate calls. We can have, did you know, should you know, things of that nature. Uh, I think it's a great growth factor for, uh, uh, for the Nevada Trucking Association. Well, hey, I, I, I love that, Bruce. And I, I will say, this is not just for Nevada Trucking Association members. Um, our, our board of directors, when, when all of this started back in March, um, we had a conversation about, do we keep this you know, within our members or is this something and we're gonna make available to all the folks in the, in the trucking community in the state? We are, this is gonna be no different. So we are opening this up. We're going to send this to every single person who's got a DOT number and an email in the state. They are going to be getting this information. They are going to be sharing this with uh, their employees. I absolutely appreciate everyone on here who's a member of the Nevada Trucking Association. We appreciate that membership, but we also understand that the industry is bigger than just the folks just the best carriers in the business who join a trade association, we want to make sure, especially in light of public health, that they have access to this. 
So um, that is that is where we're at. And Bruce, I appreciate you bringing that up. So thank you. All right. Any other comments, questions, concerns about this, or, or are we doing all right? I'll take that as a positive. All right, folks. So that's the update. And like I said, just keep watching your emails from us. This is uh, this is going to be um, this is going to be coming out soon. Um, let's go to our uh, partners in safety, uh, Mr. Benz Miller. Good to see you, Morning, Bill. Paul. Thanks. Good to see you too. Um, <clears throat> happy Friday, everybody. Um, got a couple, got a couple things today, but I'd like to. Pause. Yes. Oh, Bruce, you there? I'm here. Or not Bruce, uh, Bill. Hey, can you hear me, Paul? I, I can. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, happy Friday, everybody. I've got a couple things real quick. Uh, first and foremost, Paul, let me say, I, I may have to fill your form out uh, because even as a federal agency, when we contacted state health department, um, they were kind of like, uh, who, who are you? You know, kind of thing like that. So, you know, it, it's a valuable thing that everybody has that Paul has the contacts we have. I actually had to go to Paul to get a contact to even talk to them. So, just kind of want to give you that feedback. So I'm joking, we'll, we'll get it done ourselves, but uh, just thought I'd tell you. A um, couple items. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Nevada Highway Patrol. I wasn't on the, uh, the Zoom last week, but I would have said this if I was on it, is uh, the crash that we had down in Searchlight working with National Transportation Safety Board and all their efforts down there. Most of you don't know that it was just like the day before Christmas, and many of us were, all of us were supposed to be off. The highway patrol was supposed to be off for Christmas. And all of us got together and worked. And if it wasn't for the highway patrol and the things they did to assist the federal agencies and issue out imminent hazards to the driver and to the company, uh, it just, it would have taken weeks to what we, what we got done in hours. And I really want to shout them out and really appreciate what they've done and it helped move safety along and in working with that driver disqualifying him and working with the company so i want to say thank you very much i know don you're on and thanks so much to you and the staff down in las vegas really appreciate that um okay some actual things that i have is on tuesday january 12th we had a federal register notice that went out it was a not uh, notice of proposed rulemaking and basically it has to do with uh the vision requirements for drivers, for commercial drivers. And what it's doing is it's giving a 60 day comment period. And anybody that uh, knows this issue has been long standing vision and anything to do with physical standards has always been a challenge for the industry and for the federal government to regulate. As far as we have some people that can probably operate safely, but they fall just outside of the rules. And it's been a challenge. We'd issue waivers to them when we could. Uh, and anyway, this is an attempt to uh, change those standards to something that we believe might be more progressive and allow for more drivers to actually meet the standard as opposed to getting a vision waiver. So if you're interested in that, we've sent the information over to Paul. Uh, like I said, it's got a 60 day comment period. And then it's actually uh if you read through it, it it gives some standards as far as what we're proposing and we're looking for comments on that second of all would be a federal register notice that went out um on the 13th and on january 13th and it's a proposed pilot program for split sleeper birth this was brought to us by <clears throat> the teamsters association if you read um if you read the uh, federal register notice it's basically talking about for years and years, we've only allowed certain periods to be added with another and it had to add up, one of those periods had to add up to at least four hours. Uh, this is 
going to be a proposal that we're putting out there that if someone wants to get involved, then we would pre-select those people. Uh, they would have reporting standards to us over a certain period of time to even be eligible for it. And this would allow for like six and four and five and five splits. And we would evaluate that and see if that would be something that we could move forward with as far as allowing the industry to do it. Again, it came from the Teamsters. Uh, Paul, I don't know how ATA feels about it, but this was something that was, uh, was put out there. And we're going to allow for some of these people to do it if they put in and they meet the standards and then they'll do the reporting. Obviously, if they stop reporting or there's some safety problem, then they would be kicked out of the program. This has got, a, again, a 60-day comment period. Um, I guess that's probably it. Yeah, I talked about them being pulled. But they would it's, – it's not just sign up for it. They're going to have to have a plan that they come to us, and it'll be a detailed plan of how they do reporting and how they – meet the equivalent level of safety. So anyway, any questions on those things? Hey, I, and I just want to reiterate, I know we talked about this early on, but I just, you know, I, hey, you take a victory lap every time you can, right? Um, you know, victory today for uh, FMCSA um, in preempting the state of California meal and rest break rules that we know the trial lawyers there have, uh, used to enrich themselves through abusive lawsuits on trucking companies, not just in California, but all over the country, including right here in the Silver State. So the fact that the decision, that preemption by the FMCSA has been upheld by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, is, a, is a great thing. That is a victory. It's definitely not the end of it. Um, but that is something that we are uh, very happy about and good news on the, the legal front um, from FMCSA. So just want to put that out there again. Yeah, you bet, Paul. Thank you. Lieutenant Plowman. Morning. Can you hear me? Did good I to hear you, Don. Did sirens come in, Lieutenant? Awesome. Remember, remember you said we were all going to get lights and sirens for our trucks? Did those come in yet? Yeah, they, uh, you know, with the budget cuts, Bruce. Uh, all, right. all right, never mind. Then. Working Thank on you. it, though, working on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Bill for his kind words about NHP, you know, in, you know, in light of a tragic event like that, that crash, you know, working in collaboration with federal and state partners like that to to bring swift justice and, and do the proper things for a dangerous driver like that, you know, it, it's a positive thing out of a out of a negative thing. So, and that's what we're all about is to get those kind of drivers off the road and, and you know suspend them for an indefinite amount of time to where they can't cause that kind of safety concern in the future. Um, I, I caught the tail end of what you were asking, Paul. I was on the. I was hey, no, no worries. Oops. Uh, I screwed that up. Sorry, folks. Go back to my, uh, go back to my window. Um, I, I shouldn't have clicked, clicked on apparently. There we go. Can everybody see this now? Sorry about that. So Don, you and I had a conversation yesterday. We were taking a gander at the first part of the meeting about the um, violation to inspection ratio. And I've had a couple of calls from folks who, you know, are asking, hey, where can I get a level one inspection? The way station, Truckee way station, they're not doing level one inspections. You know, folks like to have those, um, those clean inspections, that clean bill of health. And, you know, had some questions um, that I directed to you yesterday, but I know that NHP is going through some staffing challenges. So I just, you know, if that's something you could kind of talk about and share with us. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the department as a whole is, has a significant amount of vacancies and, you know, with furloughs and, you know, the, the outcomes of the upcoming session, you know, I don't know that it's going to, you know, be worse or get better, but, you know, recruiting somebody is, it's a it's a tenuous process 
it, it doesn't happen overnight. So right now on the commercial aspect, basically here in the north, we're between Elko and Reno, they're, we're at about 50% vacancy rate for commercial enforcement. And unfortunately we can't just fill commercial enforcement because our traffic enforcement guys are, are, are suffering the same staffing shortages. So it, it, it does pose a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, you know, getting back to normal business. Well, hey, Don, I appreciate that. And I think our folks know as well as anybody the challenges that you can have uh, in staffing and how, how difficult that is. So, you know, if you're looking for to get that clean inspection, I mean, I just kind of asked, you know, for folks to, to be patient. Um, look, I like way stations, you know, in terms of, you know, having an ability for the good carriers to go in there. But, you know, we've had this conversation, you know, I feel like a hundred times with High Patrol and FMCSA, we are much more likely to prevent crashes when we have those folks, our, our law enforcement or High Patrol out there on the road, looking at behavior, looking at driver behavior, because the reality is that is what causes crashes a lot more than vehicle maintenance. You know, somebody speeding, if they're, um, not looking down the road, distracted driving, unsafe lane changes. You know, those are the kind of things that tend to contribute to crashes. And, you know, I, I for one, would much rather have our law enforcement folks looking at those types of behaviors, uh, preventing crashes before they happen, um, than have the manpower, you know, all there in a, in a way station away from it. Well, hey, is there absolutely a use for it? Yes, there is. And we like that. And we like to get those clean inspections and we like to get those level ones. But when you're trying to balance um, staff and safety, you really have to go where you get your best bang for your buck in terms of making our roads and highways safer. So Bill, Don, do you guys have anything to add on that? Or am I, am I doing a good job singing the company line? No, you, uh, you actually took my talking points, but that's great. But <laughs> I mean, really, it's it's a combination of the manpower and then, of course, the COVID restrictions. So we're trying to limit the amount of contacts as to you know to to the to the people that need to be talked to. So our focus is, and not just Nevada, a lot of the partners throughout the nation, their their focus is on driving behaviors as where it should be. Because I, I do agree with you that the the data shows that that driver error is the is the primary cause of crash. We'll take the searchlight crash for. For example, that was 100% driver error that caused that. So that's really what we're looking for. And because of our manpower shortages, that is the focus that we've put through the for this coming fiscal year is to, is to focus more on level three violations with an emphasis on the traffic enforcement initiative, which is a is a national element with FMCSA that we you know we agreed to to, to focus on. And so it it, it makes sense. Plus, level three inspections do take a little bit less time than a than a full level one. Doesn't mean we're not going to do level ones because they still are going to maintain the same level ones that we've done in the past. We just we're not going to rely heavily on the check stations to uh, to get our enforcement efforts because you can't you can't curb driver behavior at the at the way station. Don, thank you so much. Anything anything else to add, my friend? Um. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, the, the clean inspection thing, I think why Nevada is where we're at with that is that it was a culture change. You know, if people feel like if you do an inspection and, and you, there is no violations that it's that you missed something. But we don't you know, we don't pat any officers on the back for for getting a, for finding a violation that if it, if it wasn't there, you know, we're searching extensively for it. That's not there, you know. And if the, one of their triangles is broken, we're throwing that on there. That, 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 that culture has changed, and, and and all the inspectors they know that these inspections, a clean inspection does help the carriers, and so we're not opposed to it. And uh, and hopefully at some point we can get back to that type of atmosphere. And and then when we talk about the way stations, hopefully in the future, you know, those we're looking primarily to staff those with civilian inspectors. So we'll never be abandoning the uh, the mobile roving type 
initiative because that that you're right that is that is where we we're going to curb these behaviors and, and prevent more crashes there. Well, hey, uh, Lieutenant Don, I, I always appreciate that and really do appreciate that change in culture that you've continued and, you know, folks at the Nevada High Patrol have, uh, have implemented. It definitely makes a difference. And, you know, I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of that and proud of our industry that we can say, hey, we've got, you know, we've got some great carriers here that are recognized by law enforcement as running a great operation and getting those clean inspections. I know our carriers appreciate it. I know their insurance, uh, their insurance carriers appreciate that. Uh, they look at that. So, you know, that's, it's a good thing. So thank you again. Um, hey, Lieutenant, this is uh, Bruce McRae. Is there anything you need uh, the department needs? I know we talked about it when the pandemic first started, but is there still any needs you may have? Um, or, or if not, great. If there are, please let us know. You have a lot of carriers that, again, I, I just moved a, a trailer load of, of hand sanitizer to, uh, uh, to five different departments and sheriff's uh, departments here in Southern California. So if there's things you need, please let us know uh, because we're still here to help you too. Yeah, absolutely, Bruce. I really appreciate that. And I, I did pass that on to, uh, to our new, new colonel, which uh, tentatively she, she's going to try to get on on the 29th call if we have one. And uh, yep, we will. And, uh, you know, she, so she's aware of it. And, you know, that, and that's where this is all about. You know, the, the safety aspect isn't just enforcement. It, you know, we're an industry partner on the side. That's, we're all fight for the same thing. It, it just makes it, it makes it flow much better. And we, you know, it, it, it's easy to get this done. But uh, I think right now, you know, they've, they've caught up on all the, on getting the, uh, the proper PPE and hopefully we won't need that much longer. But uh, I think we're good now, but definitely I appreciate that, Bruce. And I, if, if we have any needs, I will certainly reach out to you. Thank you, sir. Great. Hey, Don, thank you very much. Um, I don't see anybody from DMV on this morning. Just put that out there, but I do want to remind everybody um, that yes, they are having some issues with uh, IFTA and IRP processing that. They do have a letter that has gone out to law enforcement um, that extending credentials um, until February 1st. So just wanted to, to put that out there. And then for next week, um, tentatively, um, this conversation that I had um, little later last night with the Congressman Amade, he is going to be on um, talking about all the fun stuff that uh, they're dealing with on on Capitol Hill. Um, so, you know, from impeachment to, you know, kind of what the what the dynamics look like in Washington, D.C. And yeah, it's as ugly as we think it is. Um, <laughs> it's as ugly as you would guess it is. Um, you know, I know this weekend, it's a, it's a three-day weekend, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. You know, I remember being 10 years old when they uh, implemented this in Elko. We had to go to school an extra day on a Saturday. Um, but throughout my education um, there in Elko County, uh, this time every year, we would sit down and watch Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, um, really a beautiful thing. And, you know, something, you know, the, the guy was an absolute hero, something that, um, you know, I always try to teach my kids is that good people and assholes come in every color with every belief and you judge people as people. And unfortunately, I think with a lot of folks um, kind of lost sight of what he talked about in that speech. Um, absolutely is a, is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, have this, uh, have this up there to recognize this. Um, if you're, uh, working on, on Monday, as I know a number of us are, um, just, you know, take a minute and think about what he talked about that, that kind of society that is, you know, one based on merit, one judging people on, 
who they are as a person, not those immutable characteristics. You know, I, I do think that's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, I think a lot of our politicians and folks in the media, they like to use those things to divide folks. And I always look to uh, MLK as somebody who, who uh, really did his best to, to unite us. Um, it's really easy to look at somebody and say, hey, I, I disagree with you or don't like you because of this or because of that. I think with politics today, we're kind of in that realm. Dennis Prager, somebody who I love and, and listen to, um, said earlier this week, you know, I think our country is divided between red and blue today a lot more than North and South was divided in 1860. And that is a scary thing to think about. And so that's why I just always like to take that step back and say, hey, we're Americans and, you know, having the values of freedom and tolerance. And I know not everybody who's an American has those values, but those are the values that I embrace. Those are the values I know so many of you in this industry and in the private sector embrace. And so just want to kind of end our call this week thinking about that. Um, I want to wish everybody a great weekend. And if there is nothing else for the good of the order, just kind of put that out there. Um, anybody have any questions or comments, um, things you'd like us to focus on? Uh, I'll give folks an opportunity to bring that up now. All right. If oh, Bruce, I saw you unmute. No, I'm just saying, keep doing what you're doing, Paul. Um, and it's uh, uh, you are our spearhead to so many issues in the state of uh, Nevada, and truly, other states look at your leadership. So keep doing what you're doing. Well, hey, thank everybody for your time. Thank you, Brucey. Appreciate you. Um, everybody, have a great weekend. Good health and Godspeed. See you next Thanks, week. <laughs> great job as usual, Paul. Thanks, Paul. See you, Paul. Have a great day. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dave.